This is Mr. Higgins, Sci Hig. Welcome, my science friends. The key ideas or concepts that are related to the laws of orbits are Kepler's first, Kepler's second, and Kepler's third law, which we're going to delve a little bit more in depth into, Newton's universal law of gravitation, and gravity wells. Scientific laws are overall statements that describe facts we observe. They can describe a hypothesis or a theory, but are considered facts rather than something that is needing to be tested. Like the equation for mass versus energy. We know it's correct. It is a fact. It's this law of equivalent mass and energy that lets us control the power of the atom, nuclear weapons. Johannes Kepler was the first astronomer we credit with giving us the laws of the motions of the planets. Kepler's first law describes motion in that the orbits, they're never circles and the larger object is at the foci of an elliptical or oval orbit. The observation that led to our understanding that orbits cannot be perfect circles originates in the orbits of Mars. Measurements of Mars' orbit didn't quite match observation unless Mars' orbit is slightly elliptical as it goes around the Sun. When we draw an ellipse, you use two pins to make a perfect oval. These are foci, related to the mathematics behind ellipses, which is beyond what you need to know for this level of astronomy. In astronomy, all objects that are orbiting the sun orbit in an ellipse, with the sun at one of these foci. This idea can be applied to any two bodies that are orbiting each other. And in this exaggerated image of the orbit of the moon, the Earth is at one of the foci of the moon's orbit. In general, plants nearer the sun have more circular orbits, while plants, planets further away from the sun have more elliptical orbits. Perfect circular orbits tend to not exist in nature. We can't get the bigger object to exist at that foci naturally. There probably is one someplace in the universe, but we have never observed it. And we'll talk a lot more about how these orbits change, their eccentricity, uh, when we get to Unit 6, about solar systems. Those ellipses that have created the orbits cause specific movements of orbits. Kepler's second law is the mathematic law that gets the area and time that proves objects get faster as they approach the foci. In an elliptical orbit, the smaller body or object is falling towards the larger object, whipping around that object and then flying back up until it falls back down again. Traveling faster near the large object and slower when further away. Now there are some fancy words that describe this nearest point and this furthest point, but for the purposes of the course, uh, you don't really know, need to know they exist. Uh, but you might hear perihelion or aphelion describing the closest and furthest points. Kepler's second law is most visible in the object that travels farther out into the solar system, like comets that will typically go way out past the orbit of Neptune. What is the underlying math that is around seconds, or Kepler's second law? We have two areas of this elliptical motion, and if we know that area A and area B are the same area, the same size of the pizza slice, uh, we know that the amount of time to go through that orbit along the edges is going to also be the same. But, and you can probably already see this in this graphic, the distance at B is bigger than the distance at A, so the object had to have traveled further. So rate or speed is distance over time, and if the distance at B is larger and these times are the same, the object in orbit must be traveling faster when it goes through that section of its orbit represented by B. Kepler's third law which is how we compare the mathematic length of the year, the period, and the distance from the sun. Kepler's third law is a way of comparing the orbits of one planet versus the orbits of a different planet. It makes logical sense that the second planet in this diagram will take longer to orbit the sun, but Kepler founded his law in the math behind those orbits that we observe. 
planets in our solar system orbit counterclockwise from the frame of reference of the North Pole. So as if you were looking down onto our solar system, you're looking down from way, way, way above the North Pole. How long the semi-major axis is measured in the average orbit of the planet is measured in astronomical units which is the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. This is just a really convenient number to use rather than millions and millions of kilometers. And so how long the planet takes to orbit the Sun is measured in the number of years it takes to complete one orbit, the period. Kepler's third law would compare these two measurements, the square of the number of years divided by the cube of the distance from the sun. That equals some sort of constant, and Kepler did not know what that constant was, but he was still able to develop this law that described what we see in nature. Comparing the semi-major axis and the periods of the planets, we can see that there is a pattern, and that pattern was a mystery at the time to Kepler, because the mathematics behind gravity took even more measurements and this is why you really couldn't discover it until Newton's universal law of gravity when Sir Isaac Newton discovers the math behind gravity and this is kind of why everything is shaped and moves the way it does. Although the mathematics of gravity were not confirmed until after his death, Newton's law of universal gravity fits what we observe in space. It's a better mathematical model. Newton showed that a force of e gravity exists between all masses, and there is a relationship between the amount of mass in an object and how far away they are from each other. The gravitational force between two objects is always equal, and since the distance value r in the equation is squared and is in the denominator, that means that the force of gravity between objects is exponentially less, or it's decreasing, the further they get from each other. Remove a mass from one spot, and the gravity goes down very quickly. If nothing was moving in space relative to each other, all objects would just crash into each other, eventually creating one supermassive black hole that contained every bit of mass in the universe. Luckily, most objects have a velocity, which is a rate of speed with a magnitude, direction, or vector. Travel just fast enough, and you achieve orbit around the larger object. This is why things are clustering together in galaxies, solar systems, etc. Travel too fast and the smaller object will escape from the larger object and unless something acts on it, it's going to fly off into space forever. Now this is happening because of a mystery to unit, Newton, the idea of gravity wells. So as things are approaching each other and they fly off into space, this is going to allow other structures to be built if we're doing this with gases, etc. in the universe. Gravity wells. This is when mass bends space, so objects can either fall towards each other and maybe miss. It might cause some orbits. All masses in space create a depression of gravity. It's not really a hole but it's a way of describing how things move around other masses. Gravity is pulling in all directions at once, and it's hard to represent gravity acting in all directions. So we simplify it into thinking of gravity as a flat plane that exists in the universe. We call this the space-time. And then can describe how objects move relative to each other from the flat plane model. You will often see gravity wells drawn or animated like this. This is a three-dimensional model of a two-dimensional idea. Gravity is pulling in all directions, with its strength decreasing the further you get away from the center of mass. This creates the well of gravity well. And the closer you are to the object's center of mass at the bottom of the gravity well, the more velocity you're going to need to escape that gravity well if you want to go someplace else. When you hear someone describing how gravity warps the fabric of space and time, this is what they're referring to 
is that the masses of everything in the universe are pulling in towards themselves if we imagine them as a flat plane. And the more massive an object gets, the more it will pull on other masses nearby and the deeper the gravity well becomes. There's a limit on how deep these wells can be. Too much matter and the gravity well becomes a black hole. With all matter and space pulling on each other, something else is needed to keep the universe moving, and that's that relative velocity of objects. The faster they go, this keeps things from collapsing due to gravity. The gravity well of our sun, combined with the relative velocities of the planets, those velocities came from when they formed, give us the orbits we observe today. Gravity wells act like conic sections, depending on what angle the orbit the object is at. And the more extreme the angle, the more likely an object is going to leave that gravitational influence of the larger object, especially if it has enough velocity. Gravity wells combine to make complex wells of gravitational influence, and then it gets even crazier when we include the rotation of objects and try to relate how all these objects are influencing each other. And so these are described by mathematical equations, but those are way outside the level of this course, but you should be aware that these sort of computations get very complex when you start adding in more than two bodies. This has been Mr. Higgins, Sci Hig. Join me next time when I'm going to talk about the motions of light, how light moves in the universe. A special thanks to my Roy G. Biv Astronomy patrons on Patreon, helping me continue creating these educational videos. And to all my science friends, this project continues with your support. You can find out how to become a science friend and get your name here, or possibly be a part of the Roy G. Biv of SciHig on the SciHig Patreon page.